Hello, man. Welcome to today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm Rabbi Richard Address, the director of Jewish Sacred Aging and your host. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and a reminder, you can visit us on our website, jewishsacredaging.com or the Jewish Sacred Aging Facebook page. And of course, we welcome your comments and suggestions to us and rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. One of the most interesting and challenging things that faces our generation as we age is um, the challenges of longevity vis-a-vis the end of our life. And we are pleased and honored to welcome one of the leading proponents of this conversation in writings and film, Dr. Jessica Zitter, critical and palliative care physician based out in uh, the West Coast in the Oakland area, um, film director, raconteur, and author of a very, very, very f- absolutely fantastic book. And if you're involved in this or interested in this and my colleagues uh, who may be teaching this in their synagogues, um, here we go. Extreme Measures, subtitled Finding a Better Path to the End of Life, um, a very Jewish book in a variety of different ways, and we'll get to that. Dr. Zitter, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to finally meet you. I've been following your work for a while and, and really enjoyed the book. Um, and thank you for thank you. thank you for being with us. How are you today? I hope oh, well. I'm so I'm great, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you. And I've also been following you for a while, hearing about some of the great work you're doing at CTAC. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's get right to it. For those of you who, for those people who may not be aware or are concerned about what palliative care is, define it for us. Uh, for us, you know, our lay people here in New Jersey, um, what's palliative care? Well, to palliate, it, it's actually palliare. It's a Latin word. It comes from palliare, which means to cloak. And so if you, if you sort of envision this a person who needs support, being cloaked and taken care of. It is really what palliative care is all about. It's really um, attention to suffering. And we are trained as an interprofessional team, which I have to say is one of the most important and innovative things about palliative care within the medical profession, is that we work with chaplains and social workers and nurses and doctors together to cloak this patient uh, in, based on whatever suffering they need attended to. And I will tell you that when we think about sort of American medical health system, we're always just focusing on one thing, which is this sort of the medical context. And the fact is, and what I have learned from so many years now doing this work of palliative care, is that if you don't have a chaplain thinking about a person's spiritual distress and suffering, and if you don't have a social worker thinking about all of the social issues that are coming up for somebody with serious illness, which, you know, you are not attending to the suffering of a person. So palliative care provides this multi interprofessional approach to attending to suffering. And I, I feel very privileged to be a part of it. Clarify one thing, because a lot of people, because I do some work in, in, in a local hospice here, Samaritan hospice here in Southern New Jersey, and we've talked to chaplains, etc. There seems to be a misunder or misapprehension about palliative care that's only for the end of life. But that, it, yeah. could you walk us through that? Absolutely. Um, I will tell you that um, it's a real problem. There, there's a marketing problem in a way, um, both for hospice and palliative care. But there's just this clumping concept. People, first of all, the, the subspecialty is called hospice and palliative care. So there's this clumping of these two different aspects of palliation. Palliative care in a hospital environment is really, that was my dog, I apologize, my, my I think she was it's trying okay. to get in <laughs> Sorry. Okay. We, we, we love dogs, okay. I love her too, but. <laughs> um, Wait a minute, what's the, what's the dog's name? Her name is Jinx, and she is deli- the most delightful dog, but she just doesn't like to be away from me, I, especially since the pandemic. So my husband is in charge of keeping her quiet right now. And I think she was trying to get in. So (laughs) back back to palliative care, palliative care is, is this, this to palliate, as I've said, could really be applicable to any type of person who's having suffering or unremitting suffering. This could be a person who could live for decades. We frequently have patients who are going to live for many, many, many years who really will benefit from our attention and service and support. We do not see palliative care at all as something that is specific for people who are dying. 
it may be true that the majority of our patients are having, you know, end of life uh, con considerations because those are the types of people who come to the attention in the healthcare system of needing extra support. But the fact is we have lots and lots of patients that we care for in palliative care who we care for for years and decades. And so when you think about what is hospice, hospice is another subset of palliative care. It's, it's palliative care for people who are actively dying, who are within six months of dying. But they are not interchangeable when you think about palliative care. You know, there's so many people, for example, who come to pulmonary clinic or cardiology clinics who have serious uh, pulmonary conditions or serious cardiac conditions who were going to live really for possibly 5, 10, 15 years, but they will benefit from having concurrent following by the palliative care team. Um, and so we, we see this all the time, and we have this ongoing relationship where people come in and out of the hospital with these serious illnesses that we know this person, we can provide continuity of care and continued conversations with them about their preferences and values based on how their uh, medical condition is going. So it's unfortunate that palliative care has been sort of lumped in with only an end of life concept. It is not true. And by the way, the other thing to point out about palliative care is we're very, I, I will tell you that I am frequently recommending more aggressive and more interventional in, uh, uh, interventions for patients than the regular teams are uh, a lot of times, because it, it, in some situations there are we, there are things that we should be doing that we're not doing that will alleviate suffering. That includes surgeries and interventions and procedures. And a lot of times it's the palliative care team that's coming in and saying, no, I think we should take this person to the operating room because we think that we're going to provide an improvement in, in, in comfort and possibly even longevity. So palliative care really isn't about end of life at all. We do take care of a lot of end of life patients, but that is certainly not all that we do. This idea of cloaking and supporting or holding very spiritual. And you write um, in Extreme Measures of, and, and other places about this thing called patient, um, patient-centered care, which I've heard discussed in other forums uh, and, can, and meetings uh, in hospice and the CTAC meetings. Could you, you write about it, obviously, you practice. What, what, define that for me. What is patient-centered uh, care? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really glad you're, uh, asking about that because we'll talk about what patient-centered care is and then we'll talk about what I've learned um, over time about family-centered care and, and, and what we've been focusing on and what the palliative care movement has really brought to the fore and I write about it a lot in my book is the importance of really thinking about the patient and the patient's preferences and values, the patient's understanding of their illness so that we can make decisions based on that person's preferences. And sometimes the person isn't alert enough to, to be the uh, decider of their medical decisions. And so we have to rely on family members who hopefully can channel what the patient would ask us to do. And that's called shared decision-making, where it's not the patient who's actually making, telling us what to do. It's, it's a shared process with people who are their best advocates. Um, but ultimately, the goal of patient-centered care is to really be doing things for the person that they would be, that, that, that work best for their preferences and values. And what that requires, honestly, is something that doesn't happen enough in, in, in American healthcare, which is a really clear communication between the people who know what's happening medically, the people who understand what the real realistic prognosis is for the patient and understand what the options are for treatment and how they might help or hurt. So that kind of information being transferred over to the patient or, their, or the people making the decisions for the patient so that the decisions are really informed by what is likely to help, what is likely to achieve the most important goals for that person. And unfortunately, what happens is we don't have a lot of that kind of communication. And so what we tend to do is we tend to default as the healthcare providers to just the highest level of intervention, which is continuing to you know support the organs with machines, with catheters and tubes and you know, intense treatments that may or may not be helping instead of really talking to the patient about what would, what would be what they would want. And what we know from the literature in palliative care is that when we do talk and communicate these things that I've mentioned to you about prognosis and about what's really going to help and what might hurt, people almost always choose a lower level of intervention than what we would be defaulting to. And I think that's really important. So we're not 
in America, too, too often we're not doing patient-centered care. We're using default treatments that tend to be a very high level of intervention just designed to keep the heart pumping. And so we have a rising number of people who are living on machines in facilities in ways that almost nobody says that they would want to live or die. You, you write about this in, in Extreme Measures. Um, uh, I think it's around, my notes are correct, around page 74, but, and, and I think an area around what some people call futile care, um, that just because we are able to do something technologically, medically, doesn't mean necessarily in a particular context we should. And then you have this very interesting sentence where you just kind of like alluded to is, the more patients actually know the less likely they are to want expansive treatment. In other words, yeah. it, it's basically saying, instead of withholding information, be proactive and give as much information so an informed decision can be made. So then what's in, in that, whether is the, uh, the importance obviously of an advanced directive or a healthcare proxy and like we have in various states, the physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. Could you just walk us through like some of that, your experience with the more knowledge, the less likely I am to keep pounding away. Um, and then we'll get yeah. to, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, uh, there's so much. To talk about. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. There's so many things to talk about here. It's hard to, it's, it's, uh, there's so many things. First of all, the advanced directive and identifying a surrogate decision maker and having conversations in families about what, what's important to you and the way you live your life and how you would always want to live. These are critically important conversations that really ideally happen before you even get into the healthcare setting. They're happening with those people who ultimately you, you trust, you love, and who will ultimately be the people who might be making decisions for you at the bedside. So to have this openness about talking about the important qualities in your life, the, 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 your preferences about how you live your life, it, to have that, that conversation early on, before you get sick, before you get critically ill, before you're in the hospital or in an ICU, is very, very important. You want to sort of be thinking yourself and then be transmitting and communicating to your family and to your healthcare providers the things that are important to you. If a doctor knows that you're the kind of person who really, really, really wants to live as long as you can, to be with your grandchildren, to be with your family, but there are certain things that would be unacceptable to you in, in the way you might be living. For example, living with unremitting pain or living with um, a, a, a decreased cognition or an inability to recognize people. Those are important pieces of information that if you transmit them to your family and you transmit them to your healthcare providers, decision-making that ensues will be more honestly courageous to support that. If, if people say, if you have advanced dementia and you're a person who says, I would not want to live, I would not want to be heroically kept alive if I can't recognize my grandchildren, then when you have that next aspiration pneumonia, which is very, very common in dementia, the focus might be to maximize your comfort, keep you calm, keep you feeling comfortable, make sure that you're not feeling alone, but it might not be to put you on a breathing machine. Whereas if you had not had that conversation, I can guarantee you that you would be put on that breathing machine if you're unable to breathe because you have had an aspiration pneumonia, which is a very, very common occurrence in end-stage dementia. So, so the, the summary. Oh. oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. So, the, so the summary, the summary of what of that point is, yes, every single person, I think starting at the age of 18, should be starting to have these conversations with their families, to be have a certain facility about talking about how what's important to them and transmitting that information to their loved ones and asking their loved ones what's important to you so that when those times come, everybody is just more comfortable talking about these difficult topics and the decisions that need to be made are made. In terms of a POLST form, uh, that's a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. That is different from an advanced directive. An advanced directive is, is, is 
First, the two parts of the ADAPT directive, number one, assign who is your surrogate decision maker, which is, by the way, a very, very important thing to do because you want the right person to be making decisions for you if you cannot speak for yourself. No one, no surrogate jump, you know, there's no surrogate uh, uh, responsibility until you are no longer able to speak for yourself. But when you are no longer able to speak for yourself, you want to make sure that you've assigned the right surrogate decision maker. Not everybody is the appropriate person to be a surrogate decision maker for you. Not everybody will be able to carry out what would be important to you. So you want to make sure that that advanced directive, which assigns a surrogate decision maker, has been completed. And it also, but it's not a legally binding um, document for determining medical treatments. What is a legally binding document that can bind your medical treatments is the PULSE, which is a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. And that will basically allow you to say, I would not want you to put me on a breathing machine. I would not want you to do chest compressions or cardioversion. Those are, uh, that's, that will, is signed by a physician. And if the EMTs get called to your house, they are not going to do those things to you, which they would by default have done if, the, if that pulse form was not there. And by the way, if you don't have a pulse form, but you know, you, when, when the EMTs get called, someone says, no, 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 she doesn't want to be intubated. You're going to get intubated if you don't have a pulse form. So you have, it's, it's really a form that, especially for people who do not want certain types of interventions, um, who, you know, w that they would have hanging up on their fridge that's signed by their doctor so that first responders would know not to do that type of treatment, but to do the type of treatment that would be more focused on comfort. You know, you mentioned something real fast. As a physician, um, uh, we've done workshops on this all over the place for in congregations on end of life and Judaism approaches, et cetera. And it always comes up and they'll say, well, yeah, my, I have my uh, advanced directive or my form and yeah, we put it in the safe deposit box. And I say, that's the worst. I mean, that's, as a physician, okay, where should these documents be? How readily visible if somebody has to come in, where should they be? Well, the pulse form, which is a kind of an urgent form, because it's saying, don't do this thing to me that you will do automatically by default. Don't do it. That should be on the, it's a bright pink form and it should be put on your, on your refrigerator. If you're traveling, it should be, you know, in your wallet and everybody should know that, it, that it's there. You know, the first responders will tend to look for your, your wallet, but you really want to make sure that that form is documented and with you and when people are at home they tend to put it on their refrigerators the advanced directive again which is the form that assigns your surrogate decision maker and you know that's a lesson to be totally frank it's a less important form the real action around an advanced directive is identify that surrogate decision maker and make sure they know what you would want and that is not a form that's a conversation that should go over years that person should have a very very deep and intimate understanding of your preferences and values. And that's not something that lives on any form. That's something that lives inside of you. So you need to be identified on the advanced director or directive, or you need to identify that person. But then there's this whole body of knowledge that needs to live inside the head and heart of that person who will be making decisions for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, not only that makes sense, but make, make sure you tell the make sure you tell your surrogate that they, that they're their surrogate. And then well, that they don't get a call. True. <laughs> get in the middle of the night and say, oh, by the way, I, said, I didn't right. know that. Who knew? Um, right, but I mean, it speaks to just a healthier family or friend dynamic where we're really talking about this function that is really an important part of life. You know, how we want to live, what's important to us, our deepest values all the way to the end. And we're not talking about that in America because we sort of think we're going to live forever. We think that the American healthcare system can fix anything. And the fact is that we all know that's not true. So let's start Let's just start having a more deep, robust conversation about life all the way through. One of the conversations that you're an advocate of and your films um, and the caregiving film, there's a link to the trailer on our website, um, is this crisis that we're now experiencing and is only going to continue, uh, this caregiving crisis. Uh, um, we, do a, we do a lot of work shops around this in Jewish sacred aging, and we identify it as a new life stage. And I really do believe it is a new life stage. It's something, as you know, it's not going to, that can last for years and years. And I also know decades. Um, we're in the middle of this right now as baby boomers continue to age out and we're concerned about our own p children and whether they're prepared to take care of us. And um, 
Talk to me a little bit about the film, the caregiving film, and then one of the and the it, 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 you, and the statistic that I think you mentioned that one in five people right now as we speak are caregivers, and the I'm amount, of, and and I think AARP, I I, I forget the exact amount of um, the impact of of the actual unpaid caregiving expenses that are accrued is in in billion. Um, talk to me about this crisis and what people can do to begin to understand it and re and hopefully deal with it. So let's back it up because I was said to you before we were talking about patient centered care. Uh, I was talking about family centered care, and I learned something by making this film. The film caregiver a love story. Well, let me back up even further to say that the film Extremis, which you can watch on Netflix is really about the things we've just been talking about. It's about decision-making around life prolonging. It's about how do you make decisions? And obviously, the premise takes place in an intensive care unit. And as we've just talked about, we really hope that people are going to be having these discussions way before they get into an intensive care unit. But extremists really kind of highlights the issues about patient-centered decision-making in an intensive care unit. Caregiver a Love Story, which just came out right before the pandemic. Not a great time for a film to come out, by the way. Um, <clears throat> basically tells the story of a couple in my synagogue, Rick and Bambi. And Bambi, if you watch this film, you'll see, is the most, a firecracker of a person, even as she is dying. Amazing and inspiring woman. And I wanted to make a film about her because we, you know, she was following that medical, you know, do everything, do everything. And then finally, she was just suffering so badly, got hospice involved, everything got better. And she was you know, it was such a transformation. I said, let's make a film. And she, she was welcoming in a, a, if it'll help somebody, I'm happy to, you know, for you to do a, a film about my, show how great it is to go home and, and choose hospice. And over the course of the nine weeks that Bambi was home, the reality was, and I only realized this after she had died and I was sort of re-looking at the footage, that the real story that needed to be told was not of Bambi's experience, but of her husband, Rick's. Because as you watch this film, you see Rick's life start at a high and really go over nine weeks into this extreme crisis. And he, I thought Rick was just going to be the guy that kind of opens the door for hospice to come in. I thought he was going to be a secondary character, but the film ended up being about Rick. And when I realized this crisis, which I had not been attuned to because I, as a doctor, am sort of focused on within the four walls of the hospital. I didn't think about what happens to people when they went home. And here was one of the first times that I actually followed somebody home with a camera. And I watched what happened, even with a wonderful hospice on board, which they were. They were a wonderful hospice. The burdens on Rick were so profound, not only, by the way, financial, not, I mean, and all this unpaid work that he was doing, huge amounts of unpaid work, which made him have to quit his job, by the way, which is another financial hit that, that caregivers take. But he took a physical and medical hit, and the emotional isolation and loneliness was profound. And when I started to read about this and realized that Rick is really one of 53 million Americans, that's one in five, who are doing this work unpaid, untrained, unsupported, totally isolated, the pandemic, I mean, this Rick is lucky that it wasn't during the pandemic because he still had friends coming and trying to help in the best way that, that we could. He had me coming as a friend, a palliative care doctor. They had the volunteer, you know, still had some volunteer support from hospice, which faded during the pandemic. You know, this pandemic made us, brought this rising public health crisis really into the light where you could start reading on the front page of the New York Times and other newspapers. Every day there's an article about caregiver burden. And, and about the workforce and, and, and women leaving their jobs to become caregivers. I mean, it has become part of the national, I think, consciousness now. So I think this is a moment. Someone asked me yesterday, when is going to be the tipping point to fix this crisis, this rising, rising crisis of family caregiver burden? And I said, I think we might be at the tipping point right now because this pandemic has raised awareness. <clears throat> the numbers continue to worsen. The professional uh, caregiving workforce is shrinking because this is a very, very difficult job, which was battered by the pandemic. As you can imagine, it's un very poorly paid. Um, and 
there's a lot of stuff going on in Washington right now. Right now, our Congress people are having a whole conversation, argument, whatever you want to call it, about how much money should be allocated to supporting the family caregiver. And it started out at $440 billion. And as my latest reading, it's down to $190 billion and clear, unclear where it's going to end. So we need to talk about, as a nation, whether or not we want to have a strategy, to a real national strategy, to support family caregivers. Because if we don't, this problem is just going to continue to worsen. It's going to worsen, as you, as you alluded to, because more and more baby boomers are, every day, 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65. People are living longer, and people are living with more illness and more needs for care. And frankly, there are fewer people to provide that care because families are shrinking. This country, our birth rate's at an all-time low right now. And families are dispersed. And so we just, we're, we're a, it's a recipe for disaster unless, if we don't do something. So, you know, we, we deal with this all the time in the work that we do. And I'm very happy that you're, that you're um, overviewing this. But uh, pardon my, the, the cynical part of me. All this is true. There are people who will watch or listen to this who are living this or have lived this. And they, they can tell you firsthand. And then we uh, shift the focus of our camera to Washington. Uh, that doesn't seem to be in touch with the person in the pew. As a physician who is on the front lines of this, just help me. What can, what can people do to, to remind these people that these are real live human beings who like you know, the people in the film, who are struggling not only to make ends meet, but to have some sense of quality of life in a life when life has been totally turned upside down. What can people do and have it meaning? Well, I think, as I said about the tipping point concept, I think we're in a place where more and more people will recognize that this is happening. More and more people will have people in their families who are caregivers. And I think that what we can do start is each of us on an individual basis can start to notice the caregivers around us. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. We can notice them. We can go up to them and acknowledge the work that they're doing. We can thank them for the work that they're doing. And we can do little things to try to support them, whether it's offering to do a load of laundry, drive somebody uh, to an appointment. Um, we can organize as communities, as synagogues. We can order, organize as neighborhoods um, to start to raise awareness about these people, notice them, acknowledge them and appreciate them, <clears throat> and see what we can do on a sort of micro level to help them. On a macro level, well, and then by the way, there's other systems, right? There's the workplace. 60% of family caregivers work. And so most of them work full time. And workplaces are not a place that family caregivers feel very safe. This is something that we've seen in surveys. They don't feel safe asking for support that we know that their work is absolutely impacted by their caregiving responsibilities. And we also know that the work, the employers are losing a ton of money, $65 billion a year is being lost by employers because of caregiver um, in a, you know, illness, um, right. missing work, et cetera, people quitting, et cetera. So this is a lose-lose situation. So employers are another group that really can look at this and say, it really seems to make sense to support the caregivers just from a financial perspective. So then there's the healthcare world. We need to start noticing caregivers. Again, you want to talk about where a magnet for caregivers is healthcare. Whether it's in hospices or, or in the hospitals themselves, we need to be doing a better job noticing the caregivers, preparing them for the realities that they are going to face when they go home. They're not necessarily pretty realities, but if we prepare people for them and we give them suggestions and support to, to, to getting as much organization to their lives as they can before they go into this role, we can help them. We can mitigate some of the incredible stress. We can also have our social workers, the social workers in the hospitals, the social workers in, in the hospices, <clears throat> do their best to connect family caregivers with the resources that exist out in the community. There aren't enough resources, but even those resources that are there are being underused. So we can do a better job matching and helping the caregiver navigate, find the resources that may help them. And then the community, you know, I, I, so I think all of these systems need to be brought together in addition to, honestly, a lot of money to create more resources and provide more support 
so that there's more of a safety net for these caregivers. I mean, they're just falling through and we, we are all going to be caregivers. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. I don't care if you're white or African American or Asian. We're all going to be caregivers, everybody. And only the very, very, very rich are going to be able to afford the type of hired support to make this not a, 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 a life crushing experience. So we've got to really see this as a, as a universal American problem that we need to do something about. I know there's some congregations, because we've helped set some of these up, who've really started to do this. And they've had caregiver, uh, honoring caregiver services. Uh, we've posted a couple of times uh, prayers for honoring caregivers. I know, because I've done this, some congregations as well have, on the high holidays, have had a blessing. People ask caregivers to rise and do a blessing over the Torah for a Torah reading, just to recognize this, the, the fifth commandment etc but it's just a, a, a beginning and um this is something that uh, obviously we're going to follow up on hopefully uh, when we're done and and in the future before we start running out of time and um I, I had a kind of funny feeling that this page full of notes that i took we weren't going to get through but i do have to ask you i do have to ask you you write in extreme measures about the unitana tokef and what this prayer and a high holidays um, and how it spoke to you in a particular period of your, your life. Could you just unpack that for us? Yeah, I, I you know, we, we read that prayer every year and <clears throat> I just, I read it and I, it seems so, so ancient, you know, who's gonna die by fire and by, by wild animal and by, and what I, what I realized as I sort of was writing extreme measures and really starting to think about this issue that I just talked to you about, which is what, why don't we talk about how we want to live and how we want to die? Why is that such a taboo conversation and, 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 and that sets us up for disaster? Because if we're not prepared, if we haven't had those conversations, we, we end up, as I've described in this, in this situation that very few of us would ever want to be. And I realized that, you know, the ancient, the, 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 I learned something from the Torah and from our ancient Jewish practices every day. But that moment of, of reading through that, and realizing that if I just read, you know, thought about how I want to live and how I might die and I talk to my family about it, I think that I would just be more, we would all have a more robust, um, understanding for each other and for humanity and for what it means to die with dignity. And when I say die with dignity, I'm not talking about medical aid and dying. I'm talking about dying in accordance with the way that we live. And I just think that we need to start having these conversations about death and thinking about death and thinking about what it could look like and how it could go and all the different ways that we could die and think about what it would be that would not be acceptable to us and what it would be that would be acceptable to us and having those thoughts and opening up our minds and our hearts to really consider our deaths is a is a is something that's not only a gift to ourselves but it's a gift to all of our loved ones we just need to the, part of life the conversations you know you mentioned uh, uh, medical aid and dying and they're just in california it's legal here in new jersey it's legal in your experience, has have you um, been involved in a lot of this in California? In your, is it part of the conversation now, or is it still sort of like, shh, we don't talk about it? Well, you know, I wrote an article um, in the New York Times, uh, I think it was in 2015, called Should I Help My Patients Die? Which mm -hmm. talked a lot about my feelings about this, about this issue. And that was at a time when I think it was oh, the one-year anniversary of, of medical aid and dying being legal in America, in, in, in California. And um, I was sort of expressing my, my, you know, feelings of hypocrisy that number one, I was really happy that it existed for me if I ever want to use it. But that as a doctor, it made me uncomfortable in some ways to be asked to do that. It goes so against the way I've been trained. Right. Over the past several years, I've become, I, as it's kind of become more of an issue around the country, I become more comfortable with the idea of it. I will say that as somebody who works in a public hospital, we almost never 
uh, have it requested by, of us. Whereas if you work at a different hospital just down the street, you know, Kaiser, for example, they're constantly having requests for medical aid and dying. We don't have them. And I think there's a really important cultural piece to understand about that, that not everybody would want that op op option. And in fact, I think a lot of the advocates for medical aid and dying think, well, everybody would want that. The fact is, most people don't want that. It's, it's a very rare person who truly wants to hasten their death. I, I, and, and sometimes you can understand why it would be, but, but very, very few people do, and especially if they have good palliative care and attention to their symptoms. A lot of the people who express interest in it, once they get palliative care, they back away from being interested in it or, or, or thinking about uh, taking the medications. But I, I think that it's an important thing for us to have I'm more comfortable with it. I have not personally been involved in any cases, which is surprising because, again, all of my colleagues who work at different hospitals come across this very frequently. Um, I just think it's really important for us to understand that, like with any uh, access to any kind of medical intervention, um, uh, the ones that are geared towards prolonging life, the ones that are geared towards hastening death, there's a, you know, racial inequities and you know, there, there are certain people who have access to those things and certain people who don't. And I think it's really important for us to think about that uh, in the context of medical aid and dying because um, it, it, it's, it's, it's potentially something which can benefit certain people in certain communities and can, can be either lack, unaccessed or not easily accessed or uh, actually cause problems for people who are in other communities. So that's a whole big conversation that I think right. I, we probably don't have time for. But I think I, I think I'm more I'm more comfortable with it. I don't personally have much involvement in it just because we don't have any real requests uh, of it. Um, I will say that it was interesting. This is an interesting anecdote. A friend of a friend of a friend reached out to me, um, whose husband has been sick for many 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 uh, years and is experiencing found caregiver burden, and said, "Can we?" Can we talk about medical aid in dying? And and um, I said, well, is your husband is your husband interested in that? And she said, well, not really. And I said, well, no, <laughs> it's not an option. But my point is that that's a sort of example of family caregiver burden and how this can really that the family caregiver burden can really cause people to go to that level of just being so overwhelmed. And we have to provide support to, to caregivers so that they are not getting to that desperate. Place. No, and and the, the the idea that you're you know talking about is that all of this is interconnected, uh, that they're not isolated silos. That when we're talking about all this and a patient and a family and the caregiver and what I want or what I may not want and how we're this is all interconnected in a very holistic, systemic way. And I think the time for that conversation, as you're pointing out and you've written um, and your films talk about. Um, the time has to be now, has to yeah. be now. Dr. Jessica Zitter, critical and palliative care physician, uh, filmmaker, uh, extremist, and the caregiver love story, both available on Netflix, YouTube. You can access that as well, correct? Well, is that both? Well, just, just so people know, extremist is on Netflix, but caregiver a love story is not yet out. We're about to have a, on November 3rd, it will be coming out on Austin PBS. Um, and you can go to caregiverlovestory.com to find out other ways to watch it. Great. And and if I'm not mistaken, there is a way that if a congregation wants to do a major program and they can get the film to show at a congregation, and that's available yeah. on on that website, right? Caregiver, right, a caregiver yeah. love story. Dot com. Caregiver love story yes. dot com. God bless. Dot yes. Com. Dr. Yes. Zitter. Um, Thank you very, very much. Stay healthy, stay well. Thank you for all that you're doing, for all your love, the, your patients, your family and everything. Uh, keep writing and um, get back to Southern New Jersey. Let us know. I'd love to, love to uh, treat you to uh, a um, Philadelphia area junk food. It's the best in the world. Soft pretzel, little water ice. You never, it's very healthy, very healthy. That's wonderful. <laughs> anyway. Thank you very much. To all of you, again, uh, thank you for joining us on today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. Um, you can, uh, if you would like to continue, help us continue this work uh, to make a tax-free donation, 
go to the website jewishsacredaging.com scroll down and you'll find a conveniently located donate button just click on that and follow the prompts and we we appreciate it very much uh again you can reach us uh, and me for suggestions and comments at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com seekers of meaning is produced at the broadcast center of the lubetkin media company in beautiful cherry hill new jersey and a big shout out to our master producer steve lubetkin i'm your host rabbi richard address and thank you again for joining us i look forward to seeing you on our next edition of seekers of meaning in the meantime stay safe stay healthy shalom mm-hmm.